I show it. It's now streaming live on YouTube. Yep, live. Okay. I will call town board workshop number 18 to order and have the clerk note all that are present along with our guests, Joe Mentor, John Story, Peter Godfrey as well, Dick Crawford. Item number one is agenda review. Anyone have anything for that? Um, just that, Mike, that we're the, the proclamation we're going to hold off. Right. And I, I'm doing one for those, for the, the quilters, but we'll hold off on those until after COVID's gone. I think they're done, but. Can I note something, please? I forgot to uh, take it off note or off mute. Yeah, so that will be delayed till the next meeting, just so that everybody knows for the proclamation. And I have let Jennifer Mentor know that. Can I note something to the board, please? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you'll notice on the way the, the format of the um, unfinished business um, reflects properly now, number one is listed as the special use permit for the um, solar project to set the public here and refer to the plan board. We had inadvertently had that as number 11 making it look like it was a public hearing that had already been set and postponed. And in fact, it had never been set or referred to the planning board. Okay. Um, also, the other thing noted is that the public hearing for Project Olive that was scheduled at the high school for April 8th uh, is also not on this because it was, it was not postponed. It was officially canceled by the board. And Karen and I took that um, to mean that it was not going to carry over. So just so note that there is an 11th public hearing that is not on this agenda and we can put it on until we um, go back to resuming a, a regular work schedule or leave it off um, regarding the uh, Amazon pro or um, the Project Dollar pro Project. That's all I needed to make note of, please. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Item. Number two is lift station eight force main replacement project. We have a request for a change order to amend the uh, professional services and authorize an additional $97,000 in construction administration inspection, inspection services for this project. We've invited John Story from GHD to join us this evening with respect to this because there were conditions that uh, caused this project to go beyond the original contract deadline, weather delays, coordination, New York State Thruway authorities obtaining an easement. Um, so we, we have some additional stuff in there. So I'm gonna turn it over to John at this point and let him explain further. Yeah, thank you everyone for the opportunity. So um, we have a, a full-time inspector on this project um, as is required for the work, um, being the, the pipeline is buried and we want, want a daily presence there to make sure it's being installed properly. Plus with the um, grant funding, the EFC requires, um, you know, full-time full inspection for this, this type of work. So for various reasons, the construction period has been extended. There's been some weather issues, some utility coordination issues, some issues on the contractor's end with staffing. Um, and it's requiring our inspector to be out there for a, a prolonged period of time. So that's the really the nature of the, the request is for um, GHD services for the extended construction duration. Um, if, I, if I may just give a, a quick update on the construction. Um, I think everyone's aware we, you know, the town board did a, a nice job last year getting the, the grant funding. So that's all being worked on um, and we're, anticipating doing some interconnections this week and we're, we're really wrapping up, I would say within the next month or so. So that fee mm -hmm. proposal of $97,000 is, is hourly. And at this point, we, we wouldn't anticipate using all of that based on the most up-to-date schedule. And also construction, the contractor has um, his bid broken down into several bid items. And on the whole, the project is coming in under um, on the order of probably about right as of today, 
probably about sixty thousand dollars under the the contractor's bid amount. So it's two point seven uh, million dollar bid. It's trying tracking to come in under, even though he had an extended schedule. Um, so it's I just offer that for information. So I believe the project is bonded for for around three point one million dollars, and if we had to throw a number at it today, based on even including the additional engineering, um, we'd be closing the project out at $2.3 million in training. What type, John, what type of, and pardon me, because I wasn't around for a bunch of this, but what types of contractor delays were we dealing with here? Um, the original contract duration was 100, and, it was either 150 or 160 days. No, I just mean with the, what issues did the contractor have with respect to staffing and manpower that caused this to go beyond the original term? Yeah, there were, there were issues obtaining an easement at the north end. And when some of those things started to happen, to be honest, he was, he was running with two crews. And while um, some things were being resolved, he cut back for a while to one crew and it caused a um, kind of an extended delay. There were a few days of, of weather related issues and then there were some utility coordination issues, both with the, the throughway authority at the bridge, we ran into a um, horizon line that um, no one had record of previous. So that was a little bit of a delay. Um, some of the water lines were deeper than the record documents suggested. So it was additional um, digging required, um, specifically at Whitehaven. Um, and then some of the, the road boring crossings had to be extended because we ran into some tough soil conditions during the construction. So. The, the construction cost hasn't gone up. And like I said, in fact, it's trending to be um, about $60,000 under the, the bid amount at this point. The throughway easement issues were more our issues. It wasn't really throughway issues. It was something that we just didn't forecast in the plan. Is that the situation? Yeah, none of this could have been totally forecasted by, by anyone really. Right. Yeah, so it's I mean, not something that the throughway authority should be paying for. It's really a town issue, is what I'm, I'm shooting at more. Yeah, yeah. The, well, through, the throughway was, you know, to their credit, they were were cooperative. All the utility companies have been cooperative. It's just not not everyone's pipes were where we all thought they were. So the only issue I see out of it, Mike, is that the contractor had staffing issues, and that is not something typically that if that caused a delay, that that should be our problem to resolve, but. I mean, if we have to do this anyways, because we got to get the grant, which was for quite a bit of money, then we got to do what we got to do. But the, uh, if I can interject, the one the one issue that was town related and it was the one that I specifically said to them, if you know, I was monitoring them going, look, tell me if this is a mission critical item. But it took us over almost a calendar year to obtain an easement from a private party that really should never have happened under that issue. And I know they've actually even requested from John, um, you know, help from their side because of their legal expenses, but they really dragged us out. And I can say almost a calendar year to get a very simple easement. Um, it was with that when the contractor couldn't work in that specific area that they started to shuffle some assets around. Um, but I asked them to tell me when that was a mission critical item, when it was a schedule critical item, they did not report back to me that that was a piece that was going to push them longer, but it did take us literally almost a year to obtain. All right. <clears throat> um, John, is there any, I guess, blame or uh, did this COVID thing slow us down at all? Um, not, it would have been, it was, Extended already. I mean, the completion deadline was back um, in January February, 6th. if I recall correct. January sixth. So, okay. Yeah. So, okay. January. 6th. So that um, recently it has. He, yeah. It, it. You know, for the last month or so, he could have been with two crews, and he, in fact, he had two crews. And then um, once the incentive came out with the unemployment, quite frankly, he had a, a crew <laughs> pull off because all his guys said, "Hey, I can make more on unemployment." So he, there was a little bit of hardship in the last month or so related to that. Just wonder if we could point the dial to any of our um, increased costs to the COVID thing. That's, I guess, basically what I'm asking. So. Uh, a small portion of it, yeah. Okay. Would we be able to quantify that amount? Just 
I'm not sure if there's any chance of being reimbursed for that, but from by the state or federal, is there any way to quantify that, John? We could certainly take a stab at you know production rate on two crews versus one crew for the last say say month or so. So we can make an um, educated estimate on that, Mike. Yeah, Mike, that's exactly that. where I was going. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Yep. Yeah. Good, good catch. Great idea, Pete. Thank Peter. you. Good catch. Anything further on on that? John's story, because um, I know we have a couple of Johns here. The, re the reason Pete asked that is because our accountant is having every department keep anything that could be related to that kind of relief sent. So if you want to send that information and you have Pam's email address, she has a good file going on all that. Okay. Err on the side of, err on the side of, you know, sending it and not being able to submit it. No, we'll submit it. It's, right. And they may deny it, but right. it's, it's definitely worth a stab at it. Yeah. Sure. And he's determining what to send. Yeah, right. we can do worth that in the question. short order. Right. It's, I mean, it's going to be an effort of, you know, the initial project was supposed to be done January. Okay, we cast a new completion date. What is the difference between the new completion date and the real completion date is the thing that they're going to look at and say, what's your, what's your challenge? I, you know, because we started up again with a, with a, with a new completion date and are we going to hit that or not is where the COVID piece would be a, a, a part to play is my, my gut feeling. Well, well and make an argument that, John's that we have, if they would have put on two crews when they were able to resume <clears throat> work in March, but the COVID-19 prohibited that because they couldn't field two crews. And that's, that's the difference. That's the number we're going to try and quantify. Right. And that's what we'll submit for. And John, cost, sorry, yeah. are they still on track to hit the June 1st for completion and July 1st for final completion? Yes, they are. Yeah, and in fact, they're ahead of that. We've had some good discussions with DEC in the last week. Um, they're going to tie in the, the station 17, which is the, the pump station um, in the Burger King parking lot. That'll be tied in hopefully Wednesday. And then all the tie-ins at station eight are projected to be done in the next couple of weeks. The, the entire pipe is in at this point. And it's been pressure tested and it all passed the pressure test. Good. So the, the bulk of the work is done. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Anything further on that item? Thanks for joining us, John. You don't have to stick around if you don't want to. Thank okay. you, John. You got some Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody. All right. Hi. Goodbye. Take care. Item number three on our agenda this evening is Recreation Department special event and program schedule. Joe Mentor has put together quite an extensive list of things starting with Memorial Day, 4th of July, youth and adult program, seasonal summer staff, other questions and concerns. And uh, he's done a great job explaining all that. So we'll just open it up for discussion. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. I'll, I'll start it and then, uh, you know, we can go from there. Um, you know, like with everything else, we're in unprecedented times and trying to make decisions um, based on the information that's out there, which is, is, is changing day to day and trying to make decisions for uh, one, two, three months down the road. Uh, a lot of different things that play into that. Um, Jen, you brought it up last week at the meeting and, uh, you know, we, we said we we're going to wait until, uh, this week to make a final decision, uh, to see if there are any changes or, or, or what changes were going to be made, um, from the, the federal, the state level county and all that. Um, as far as, uh, programs and, and recreation and things like that go, there haven't been a whole lot of changes from the, uh, the state government level. Um, I think one big thing that came out of uh, Governor Cuomo's address that I, he uh, had earlier today was the, the four phases of reopening. Um, and really the fourth phase was events, um, concerts, recreation, and, and things like that. Uh, so I think one thing looking at trying to project uh, with this list that, that I sent to you, um, Recreation is phase four, so it, it's kind of one of the last things that once the state does start reopening, um, it looks like it's going to be done with different areas opening, uh, uh, 
you know, ahead, like maybe central New York ahead of downstate and western New York. Um, you know, just looking at that, we're we're the, the last phase. So um, anything happening in the near future, I, I just don't uh, see it happening. So I don't know uh, what other input we have on that, but. So I did I ask uh, Chuck Malcolm about uh, the gathering that um, the VFW was planning to do. And uh, per executive order 202.10, basically he's prohibiting that. So I would, I would just question, it seems like BFW wise for the actual ceremony, if we extremely limit like 10, maybe 10 or 15. It say that Mike. What's that? It doesn't say that. No. It prohibits it. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go by the advice of our attorneys. I'm not going to wing it here. Do we have an say, attorney on right this now? Is, is Peter it. on? Peter's on, right? I'm here. Peter is on. Chuck is not. And, and Peter, just in terms of advice, I mean, I would think if when I look at like even in phase one um, for what the federal government's saying, it's saying groups of 10 provided you keep people spread out as long as you can keep social distancing and, it, and you can do it safely, it seems like we could probably accomplish this, this particular one with a very small limited number of folks from the VFW. And I, I mean, if it's yeah, 10 or fewer and they're socially distanced, you can, we know common sense wise, we can accomplish it safely. Yeah, it's not a common sense question. Can you guys hear me by the way? Yes. Yep. Okay. As much you play in GTA is. over there, Peter? Oh. <laughs> yes, so yes, exactly. Um, if you take a look at the, uh, I'll write with you, Patty, if you take a look at the, the uh, guidance itself, Chuck cited it right in that 20210 executive order. Um, all non-essential gatherings of individuals of any size for reasons including worship, celebrations, parties, other social events, canceled or postponed. So that that remains in place at, at, at this point. There isn't a social distancing size on a you know same as we can't go to church on sunday but wouldn't you think that that's going to change by the first of by memorial it's weekend it's well that that's possible, like, possible. It, it is very possible probable. i i, would I, I have, it very i won't speculate on that that won't change yeah I'm, I'm not telling you i know what the governor is going to do uh next month i mean this is effective uh, through May 15th, I believe I can confirm the date, but that's the current. It may be extended by further executive order. But so on that note, before we say no, I would rather us wait till this, the second meeting in May and let's then decide whether we can proceed in compliance with what the governor is saying. I, will I, with I don't think that anything we're talking about here is going to take an extensive amount of planning. It's not like the 4th of July parade. Correct. Yeah. Something where Joe has to book a lot of a lot of uh, groups and get don't get uh, receipts and stuff for that uh, commitments. I don't know that we'd be able to pull that off at this point. But uh, but this is something that really I think a couple trumpeters, you know, people stay in cars. Any, any, yeah, any uh, they uh, cars. Like their families. The Memorial becomes, Day. Um, you know that the, the it's going to be a lighter ceremony um no matter what uh yeah. the, the big thing that the high school wind ensemble uh who's you know normally about a 60 piece ensemble that's there um they're not, they're not going to be able to be there right that we wouldn't want them to be there component, um is, is not going to happen um so yes as far as the planning small of it, contingent it, yeah small contingent from, from the vfw with the vfw the american legion um, they're on board to do either a, a virtual ceremony if we have to do it, just just like uh, you know right now. They're also on board to have a, a small contingent of uh, where it'd be a total of, of ten to twenty people between the American Legion, VFW, and town officials, and then uh, no no crowd gathering whatsoever if that's Correct. what the mandates are at that time. So. Um, waiting until May 15th or 16th, 17th, somewhere in there, in there to make a, a final decision on Memorial Day is is uh, doable. Okay. So, so we'll keep collaborating with um, you on the IT stuff.
Tom and I will message you as we test stuff internally at the location, just so you can feel comfortable with that. Yeah. Because I think those tests are going to be report uh, important regardless. Yeah. Joe, jo, what and is you know, your another, drop dead? When another, do you, when do you have to know by? For Memorial Day? Yeah. Uh, look at the calendar real quick. I mean, if we make the no go date, whatever our second meeting is in May, May maybe. Yeah, May 18th. That's probably doable. Today. That's probably. Yeah, yeah, May 18th is doable. Um, okay. The biggest thing is going to be making sure that the technology component of it is there, whether it's. Not a problem. Small contingent being at the Glopper and having it broadcast over the YouTube channel, um, or it's doing it completely virtually, um, where we'd have the Zoom set up and uh, do that. But neither uh, because everyone's already in communication, ha having the, the May 18th decision is, is doable. Great. Okay, good. So what's next okay. on the list there? Fourth of July parade. Joe's suggested plan is to cancel the parade and hold a virtual Dick Bessel Independence Day run. Joe? It hurts. It hurts. It sure does. Um, but looking it's at the... For all of us. Yeah. Looking at the uh, reality of it, um, getting the groups in, uh, getting the, the permits, um, you know, whether or not we'd be able to get the permits from the state and county. Um, is a question. Um, looking at uh, what the mandates are going to be at that time um, and, and trying to control five or 6,000 people in the crowd, Ooh. making sure they're, they're at whatever the mandates are, the six feet apart. Well, the only way to wear masks, um, getting the proper P PPE for the uh, uh, seasonal staff that would have to be you know, working the event right now, uh, that's hard to come by. And, you know, right now it's going to our, our essential workers. Um, they're coming in. It's, it's tough to get enough uh, just for that. So th those are just a few of the reasons that the decision has to be made now as to whether we are going to uh, continue to plan to do that. And then two, two questions for you, Joe. First is if we were not to make the decision until the first meeting of June, could you still get those permits? If so, the only way I think we would ever say yes, we would go forwards is if the social distancing was no longer required and masks were no longer required, which probably is unlikely at this point. But if on June 1st, it sounds like that's a potential would you still have sufficient time in the month of June to put this thing together if it looked like we would be able to move forwards with it. it. It would be a stretch. I mean, planning for this usually started, you know, uh, really? in January, but as far as the permits go, um, usually those are submitted by mid-May. Um, so whether the, the, the county and the state would have that turnaround time, I don't know what their staffing is like. Um, and how they're doing that. So it would be, we can put it in and see what happens, but if they're not in by, uh, you know, another week or two, that, that part of it will be uh, cutting it close. Because I'd be disappointed if, let's say, Bisons is having baseball games and everything else on July 1st and to see us not have what I think is a pretty important thing for the town. I know it's overly optimistic to think that we're going to be at that point, but, you know, maybe even if it's a smaller than usual, you know, whatever we can put together, we can put together. Well, how do we, Mike, I don't know. I mean, the, just the number of staff that, that Joe would need to make that happen, that he may not have this. I mean, there's a lot of variables beyond just getting the permits in. I mean, he needs staff to help get things together. And if he's not going to have programs, he may not have staff. I mean, I'd like to think, yeah, by July 4th, we can do something. And, and we're fortunate enough on the island that this is a big problem for us because we have an excellent turnout for our parade. And this is a big hit. Right. That's why, I, I mean, maybe we even just wait till the next meeting and just see what, I mean, I, I see the numbers going down pretty dramatically. I mean, we're below, I think it was like 250 today for New York State as a whole. 
So, I mean, that's a big dramatic drop. I mean, what's it going to look like in two weeks? What's it, what's it going to look like in four weeks? Yep. Joe, I don't do know you... if um, knowing the phases, if there is actually enough time or even if we feel like we could be compliant, I don't think there's enough time there that the state would allow us to progress through those phases to get to phase four. And I don't like that, Mike, one bit, because um, I feel like we could do it really compliantly, um, some elements of it, but I, I don't see with us operating under county and state regulations as being able to do it. Yeah, and, and back to the, you know, what you said on the numbers, Mike, you look at some of these states that are uh, starting to open up early and you see some reports that, that they're starting to see spikes again, um, just because we're going in the right direction. Um, you know, July, July is, you know, two, two months from today, um, but still we don't know what's going to happen in between then and, and looking outside of the area um you know just looking at that whole picture i well, so, i don't like to say it i don't want to say it but I, I just don't so it wouldn't hurt though i don't think to wait two more weeks before we make the final decision You're let's right. just see what the numbers look like i'm hoping for a yeah. miracle i'm hoping sunshine and heat will suddenly just wipe this thing out i'm going to go yeah, with the trump theory on thursday but i just what's that I'm, I don't think no, I'm ready to give up Thursday. on the 4th of July yet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's just so see what the, let's right. see so what the results look like in two we weeks. We can talk about this from nine ways to Sunday. Yeah, let's oh, hold off two weeks. Talk about more in two weeks. Yeah, we're, we can, we can, do, we can do May 18th for a final decision, but anything beyond that, if we don't have a solid yes, um, it, it, it can't go. Um, Joe, in the meantime, can you kind of just like – really finite break down the programs. Again, maybe it could be a limited access type thing, virtual, um, what's what, you know, I obviously got to close the road. There's a lot of pieces to the 4th of July parade. I know that, you know, the, the run, I don't particularly see that probably working out, you know, um, could somebody feasibly be in a parade and social distance? Yes. Can we have a crowd there watching it? Probably not. Um, you know, so just think about all the elements you know what I mean? So we can break it apart a little bit if we have to. Yeah. yeah. In the meantime, let's pray for a miracle. Yeah. I mean, Big common drop. sense common sense tells me we're out, but the Grand Islander of me says we got to do this or we're losing. You know? I'm with you. With you. So. Yeah. Joe, along those lines, um, as we prepare for the next meeting to make the decision, I like that you're thinking outside of the box with the virtual run and things like that. If, if you come up with any other ideas, um, Whereas Grand Islanders, we can unify in a spirit of patriotism and, uni and unity um, in relation to the July 4th. So this year, though different, can still be something that families can prepare for. And we can find a way um, as town government to do something special. If you have any ideas in that realm that you want our support on, um, it would be great to work with you on that. I see a lot of grassroots things happening like that. But if we want to do something as a town to still honor that day, we're all ears. Yeah. Anybody yeah. have any ideas as to what the VFW is planning for for the Fourth of July? Nope, not sure. Um, and, the same boat we are. Yeah, and Joe, what I, mean. I wonder if they've already canned it or. Um, I know that uh, when we spoke last week, um, other communities in the area have already canceled their Fourth of July yeah. activities. East Aurora has City of Tonawanda, North Tonawanda, um, anything they do for that. Um, so we're in, we're in one, one thing that we do have going for us with that is some of their events are heavily dependent on sponsorship. Um, and, and they don't have that commitment, uh, where most of our programs are supported by the taxpayer base. So we do have that little bit of leeway where we're not looking as much um, at that financial end, you know, whether it can run because a sponsor is, is present or not. Um, so that, that, that's one upside that gives us a, a little bit of leeway to make those decisions. Um, but. And, and Joe, just to be clear, if, if, if we do have to cancel this, we still owe this town one hell of a parade. Yeah. Whether it's, an, it's August, September, whatever. 
Has, a lot of communities are pushing it off the Labor September Day. September 17th. Yeah. Um, Joe, moving on from the fourth, unless anybody else has anything else to add. No. As far as your plan for the, the programs and staff, I think that's all good. Push the date off. We can, we'll keep it on our radar. We'll keep this whole document on our radar next two weeks and go from there. All right. Yep. So right now then we'll, we'll follow that plan. Uh, it was put out there, push the, the start date back, uh, push the, the registration open date back. And, uh, you know, again, that gives us time that the when, one thing we definitely don't want to do is, is take money from people right now and then have to go refund it. And, and do yeah, that. I was going to say, when you when you solicit registrations, whether it's through an email blast or whatever, I think it's important just to note that what you said about the phases. Unfortunately, this type of stuff is way at the end. So yeah. we're doing registration because we're hopeful we can salvage something, but it's a definite possibility that we don't get there by the time it makes sense to run any of the programs. So yep. disappointing. Thank you. Joe, are you still thinking about um, doing some, do you want to um, entertain the idea of doing some virtual programming? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, you know, if we can do that through the zoom and uh, I know that, that you guys as the board are working on that. Uh, we've got some staff working on ideas and things that, uh, you know, we can do so. Okay. If you want to do any trial class before the summer, before your busy time, um, we're going to go over our plans for um, that tonight and uh, let us know and we'll get you what you need. All right. Yeah, we can definitely set up some trial stuff. Uh, Crafts board type to learn how to contests or things like that, you know, things that the kids can do at home and then maybe submit and get judged on or who knows, things like that might be a thought. Yeah virtual um yeah other than that uh, i'm just looking at my list here i think that was it if there's any other questions thank you joe all right sure thank you i was going to come up with great ideas thanks, joe. Thank you. yeah thanks joe item number four is the moratorium on solar until law is passed Michael. And uh, I know, Pete, you had brought that up, uh, Marston. Yes. As a possible consideration. Do you want to discuss it first? Uh, you go ahead, Mike. I just kind of brought it up for discussion. Right. Because um, I, I, I'm very concerned with what we don't know about solar. And that's, that's my biggest concern. Um, I, I really think as far as the effects to our infrastructure, um, how much we can allow um, how much our grid will hold, how much, how much our grid may hold in the future. We, we just have a lot of questions and infrastructure is usually the biggest reason you, you hit pause on anything, you know, if right. it's a subdivision and we didn't know we had enough sewer, we would pause, you know, so that's kind of just why I threw it out there and I'm open to discussion. And um, so Pete, um, Godfrey, I mean, I think what, Pete Marston just mentioned is a concern, but also we're in the middle of trying to get a law through with the, the pause that we're in. We, we can't do the, the hearings, et cetera. And there's decommissioning plans. There's some protection of certain sensitive wildlife and or um, mature forest areas, things of that nature. I, I would really like us to consider putting a moratorium temporarily in place until we get that law into effect and also to, to, to do some of the additional reviews that Pete Marston just mentioned. Are we able to propose such a local law? It seems like we could do that. Is that correct? You could enact a local law that would uh, impact certain approvals in relation to projects while you're considering potential modifications to them. Um, okay. We can have, you know, there, there's some legal nuance to it that's better discussed in a privilege session, but at a high level, um, you know, moratoria are short term measures, they can only be done by local law. So we'd have to call for a public hearing draft a law. Um, we couldn't do it by resolution. Um, but, uh, you know, we can certainly have that discussion if that's a direction that the board would like to go. Okay, you know, so before we go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. <laughs> so I don't want to be devil's advocate. But I mean, we need we need to look at all sides of this and just understand 
we have to have a reason to do a moratorium. It has to have, it has to be a good reason. Um, I also feel that it's a little problematic to do it under these conditions, the way things are going right now. Um, Cause we certainly aren't open for business or, and we're not exactly closed for business either. So to, to just kind of jump ahead of everybody and put this in place during this is might be problematic. It might be a bad look. So um, let's talk about this more in the next session if we can. Well, Pete, I think to the, the bad look at Peter Godfrey just answered that question for us. I mean, we'd have to do a law, have a public hearing, and we've got 11 other public hearings in the hopper that, well, one of them is a solar project. I mean, ultimately, right. Right. you know, I think we did some great work on, on finding some middle ground with the solar law. And I am very hopeful that when we get that over to cab into the planning board, we're not going to get beat up too bad. And we can get that in place relatively quickly. So I think, yeah, why don't we keep the idea alive? And once we get back to work, we can see how quickly it gets through those boards and we can start the process and we may or may not need it. Maybe Bob Westfall can reach out to National Grid or somebody from engineering can reach out to National Grid about those other issues about the, you know, how much room do we have. But those are really you know, I, I, I do feel strongly we need this solar law modification in effect before we approve the next solar project. I also I, would like to see what happens with the, cur the current solar projects. I want to see what, it, what do the pollinators look like? I haven't seen many pollinators being planted over there. I just like to better understand what we're signing up for for the next projects. But I, in particular, the decommissioning plan and some of the other requirements that are in the the proposed law, I would like that law in effect before we approve the next solar project. Well, keep in mind too, Mike, that all these are on a special use and we can grant, we can, I guess, require certain conditions which are reasonable to any special use. So we can cover our bases and basically take our draft law and say, we want this, this, and this, because that's what our draft law looks like. And we feel that's what's probably gonna go forward. So we won't be complete, we're not completely helpless here. Um, but I understand your point. Uh, Peter Godfrey, I mean, if the if the current law st states certain specific requirements, but doesn't include the new requirements, are we able to include that as part of the special use? Or should we talk about this in executive? Peter, you just muted yourself. Let's talk about this in exec session, Mike. Got it. Okay. Item five, coronavirus building and vehicle protocols. I believe I like Mr. It. Crawford is the author of the list that was in our packet this evening. Dick, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Well, no, I'm looking for additional input. If uh, the board has any additional things, you know, as we continue to, to talk and, and monitor the best practices that we hear on, uh, on TV, the paper, the the internet, um, you know, this is a, a changeable document to make sure that we are putting into practice for our employees the best possible uh, solutions to keep us all safe and healthy. Um, at this time, it's been it's been looked at by by the board, department heads, uh, our our attorneys, um, other staff, um, and we we think it's a good start to put something in place for especially our townwide crews that are uh, operating motor vehicles, any, any type of equipment. And everyone needs to be, um, everyone needs to know as far as our employees that uh, as we've heard a million times, we're in this together and we're in this together also for sanitizing and cleaning um, anything and everything that we touch during our work shifts um, when other people are, are working with us also. So if my suggestion to the board would be that if you so desire tonight to adopt this and it be given in a memorandum to every employee so that everybody is dealing with the same protocols and we're not deviating from them. Um, and Again, as I said, this is a open working document that that we can we can add to, we can change and uh, modify to make sure that we are protecting ourselves and the public. 
I like the idea. Real quick, um, great document. You, you definitely don't need help pulling something like that together. The biggest thing I think we'll hit with it is what you've already alluded to is that the document, um, unlike a lot of our other documents that we have, be it our you know, safety manuals or our um, town policies, it's going to be changing. So we need to find a way to efficiently get this on a weekly basis. Um, similar for a good reference for the board members, um, Association of Towns, they always have a frequently asked questions and every day they're changing it based on new information. So we need to find the best way to get to all employees, not just department heads, um, because everyone is scattered at times right now and might go three or four days without seeing their department heads. We'll have to really stay on top, I believe, of monitoring it and updating in line with state and county regulations. But yeah. good job overall. And another thing is I think Dix is a great place to start for something that we can send to all of the employees. These are the basics. And I think each department is going to have other things that they can add to the list. Jen Mentor sent us her thing this morning. Um, Dick, for you guys, what about staggering your start times by like 15 minutes, start and end time so there's fewer people in the garage? That's something that you and Tommy Dorak with the parks guys might be able to do just so that there's, there's less time where you're all in the same place at the same time. I mean, there's little things that the department heads, I think we're going to have to rely on them heavily to, to create their own plans that are specific to theirs that go above and beyond kind of, here's the bare minimum, you're wearing a mask, this is how often you're cleaning, you're doing X, Y, and Z, but there's nuances that each department can then beef up to make sure they're even more adequately protected. So, yeah, so what I, I would propose on that is, I think each department head should look at their deployment relative to shifting hours and things of that nature. I don't think that should necessarily be in this document. I do think the document right. that Dick has proposed is probably, 90% of the way there, but like, it's going to be a living document. Yep. I do like the idea of um, approving it for distribution with the employees as part of our regular meeting tonight, if Absolutely. that is acceptable to everybody. So I guess I'll, our meeting agenda sorry, for Pete, this So I guess I, I'll kind of echo what everybody else is saying. It is a great start point. Um, I think, I think we will, it will be a living document. It will change. I think different jobs call for different measures. I think, we'll learn that, I guess, as we apply the rubber to the road, so to speak. Um, but we'll get through that. But I think it's important that all, all our um, employees know that we're really serious about this. And I think it's a great place to start. I think it should be distributed to everybody as they come back to work and maybe even signed off on. Um, that's, you know, I'll leave that signed discretion to the board. Idea. That's a great um, idea. Just Dick, so did you get any feedback from the um, union? Heads on this? Um, the only union that, that, well, they looked at it and didn't have any issue that was instrumental in uh, working on it is Teamsters. CSEA and ASPE were in the room uh, when we put this together. So great. Um, and, and as I said, um, I've spoken to or had an email back from probably just about every department head. Um, and, you know, I think as we all agree, this is a living, breathing document that, that we will look at, you know, as you mentioned, Jen, weekly, daily. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a, there's not a supervisor that works for the town of Grand Island um, as a department head or, or whatever that isn't looking every day and talking to their employees and making sure that everybody is, is complying. And um, I know a couple of guys in my shop aren't, weren't happy to hear me yell a few times, but but again, this is uh, this is about all of our safety, not just one person. So, Dick, did you get other comments on the draft that you circulated? I did not. I, I got a, just a couple of, of uh, agreement emails, but no changes at this time. So the the one that you're we're talking about is the one that's still the construction industry coalition recommendations. Is that that's the baseline that you're working off of? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I've updated that a little bit just to make it applicable to the town. I wasn't sure if there were other recommendations or ideas that people had. And then there's some like policy questions in it. Like, you know, do, that, do we want to look at temperature and stuff like that? Yeah, Peter, that's a different one. That's yeah. Oh. That's what I thought. This is, this, this is, this is some, more geared towards the page, one page uh, protocol. It says draft coronavirus building and vehicle protocol. Okay. The building and vehicle protocol. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Just has about um, seven, eight bullet points. And then on the bottom yep. has a COVID-19, what's new, which yeah, talks about your symptoms and stuff like that. Peter, that, that the plan that you're referring to would be um, something that, that as you look through it and the, and the board looks through that kind of a plan, that would be the comprehensive plan that would be part of an emergency procedure document okay. that we would have in place for the future in the event that any of this kind of stuff happens again, um, because it's more comprehensive and it includes, um, you know, uh, what we would do with contractors and sign off some projects for them. You know, projects were already going on when this hit, and um, so Dick, I got to cut you off. We got to keep this rolling. Yeah, we're gonna run out of time before our regular meeting. We got a lot yeah. of items to cover. So we're good. I'm good. I entertain a motion to have the draft coronavirus building and vehicle protocol distributed to all town employees. So moved. Second. Motion by Pete Morrison, second by Jen Bainey. Any further discussion? Thank you, no. All in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries. So Rhonda has the word document on this um, right. between her and myself tomorrow, Rhonda, if you want, we can, we can make sure that uh, we have exactly what's needed and uh, then figure out how it's going to be dispersed. Thank you. Item number six, virtual meeting plan, Zoom virtual meeting plan. That was uh, Jen and Tom, I believe. All right. Um, I'm gonna do a screen share here. I was operating off an old agenda, so I had things out of order a little bit, but tell me if this comes up. Do you see the document? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I really wanna emphasize the working document portion of this because these are really just um, ideas to get us talking in the same direction, which can be hard to do when we're having a virtual meeting. So the first portion you're going to look at here is um, our recommendations. First, we're looking at purchasing five additional Zoom host licenses and you'll see outlined there why they would be three board members, the supervisor's assistant Rhonda is graciously willing to come on and assist with this. And then I put ZBA in secondary brackets if needed. Um, if you have time, spend some time um, examining what I've mentioned here under portion B, expand the subscription to include Zoom video webinars. Um, if you go to zoom.us, you will see Zoom is progressing and unfolding really wonderful um, options to serve uh, their market. So town board meetings is actually considered one of the usages for their video webinars. There's the promo that's a minute and 15 seconds and there's a promo that 40, that's 45 seconds as well. The pros that I just wanna highlight for you because they, um, they dance around some things that Chuck Malcolm brought up to us that would be important if we ever want to use the, the video webinar for any of our, um, for a portion of a public hearing. Um, it would allow for registration of attendees which is actually really important for Hattie as she notes who is speaking. Um, the host controls the ability to promote any singular person, any attendee to be an interactive panelist. That means we can move up someone to talk one at a time while up to you know, 100 or 150 other people are muted. There's also a live Q&A chat that's included in there. So um, if someone wanted to come on and um, engage or ask a question, they could if we wanted to allow that in any uh, situation that we might have. And then in addition, we can expand the number of participants allowed at a virtual public hearing. It comes with 100 we can purchase additional ones if we need to. And then um, secondary, or I shouldn't say secondarily, here at the end, there's a little note that Tom and I put in just for the general public and just to focus our thoughts here. Um, I, you can just read over at the goal of the board. We're not trying to replace public hearings or advisory board meetings, we can all agree on this, but we're trying to govern in a transparent way and you'd utilize current technology during this unprecedented season. And then we're emphasizing again, Traditional methods of correspondence, phone calls, letters, emails, we, ought, we want those all still, but this is an additional thing and leaving hearings open to allow maximum engagement in as many ways as possible. So what we're looking for really is um, agreement and moving forward with additional licensing um, and then expanding to the webinars when we need them if we ever decide to have public hearings in a virtual setting as one, um, one, way, one mechanism for doing a portion of a public hearing and then expanding for larger attendance at those. None of these things are very costly or demanding of our time. Um, does anyone want to talk about that page first? 
or is there anything I, we tried to reflect the conversation from two weeks ago thoughts i think you covered it okay um the second part um we're trying here are we seeing next steps on the screen yes yep. okay so these are these are the next steps technology wise that we'd be looking at um as a town right now i have the star next to this first one because this is where we currently are gather updated email addresses from all advisory board members. Rhonda may have let you know that she's undertaking the daunting task of not only getting every advisory board's email address, but their preferred email address that they would use if they were to have a virtual meeting. Then um, here, license purchasing. We've already done some of that, as you know, for Tom and myself, and we would expand that. The next thing that we see needing to happen would be new host training. So getting Mike, Pete, Rhonda, John, um, someone from the ZBA if needed, because we, Tom has reminded me as well, we have to be careful um, uh, with the boundaries between ZBA and town government, making sure they're comfortable uh, using the tools that we have, scheduling and setting up a meeting, live streaming it to, I wrote Facebook, this should say YouTube, live streaming it to YouTube, um, making sure they're comfortable with that. Then uh, a practice meeting with the chairs and co-chairs of the advisory board, no content or anything like that, just simple troubleshooting, getting everyone comfortable with the technology. And then a streamed meeting with chairs or co-chairs. I did say four and five in some cases could be combined into one or some boards might have prefer to do it on separate, separate days. Then um, actual meetings with the advisory boards, those ones would have an agenda based on um, addressing matters, and I chose the word here carefully, deemed necessary during the quarantine. We can't tell them what they're gonna talk about, um, but important things that they feel as an advisory board when they set their agenda, they wanna talk about, we would. So those are kind of the steps that are before us right now, um, and we'd love your feedback on them. The only thing I think we're missing is one thing we need to do to the extent we're gonna have written commentary and stuff like that is we need to develop defined procedures for how that'll occur. So whether it's an email to the town board, it's an email to Patty's office, it's an email to a, an email we create. So we need an email address, a particular physical address to send this stuff to. So it all goes the same place and it all becomes part of the record. I think that's very important. If we're going to do it, we've got to do it the right way. And we have to do it the same way for everybody. I think consistency is very important. And I also feel that we could probably use the majority of a workshop on its own talking about this subject just to get it finalized. It, it, I think for what it's worth too, you guys can, for the public hearings and stuff like that, I think those comments, we should find a way to make them public before, before or during the hearing, we post them somewhere. If we get an email, we get everything out there because if that person was gonna come to a, to a town board meeting and say it to us, Anybody who heard it could hear it, but again, this is all stuff that we can yeah. work on again over the course of the next two weeks so we can finish the rest of our long agenda here. But Are we way off on anything else here? Um, I, Tom did mention that. I forgot to put it in when I was typing it, so I put it here so I don't forget. We can be in contact with links on that, and then anytime um, we have a chance, be it in the paper, online, we can promote that email address. Um, Jennifer, just... just um, just making sure I'm not on mute, just to make sure or to check. So if we do a town hearing, let's say it's something someone's really interested in, what's our limit? Is it 100? Is it 150? How many people can log in? Well, you would want someone logging. This, that will be where the communication piece comes in. You want someone logging in and actually attending the meeting if they're going to speak. In terms right. of someone, we're going to encourage people if they're not wanting to speak at the meeting, but just wanting to view it, we're still going to encourage them to uh, just view the live stream on YouTube. Okay. So this would be for people who actually want to comment and they'll register. But we'll the aim actual participants. Yeah. Would we actually have a hot link that they could get into the Zoom meeting where they could yes. participate though? Okay. And there's yep. a way to do that maybe on our website. Is that how we would do it? Yep. Or how would we do it? And that? that's that's part of the stuff, Mike. We need to have procedures because we need to find a way to when we do it, we need to be able to publish that information for the public. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, oh, did I just? You're good. No, I don't know if I messed it up for everybody else, but. Uh, no, I hear you. A lot of, there's a lot, we, I think we've got a good base plan here. 
there's still a lot of minutia to kind of work through to make sure we do it, you know, the little kinks to work out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to answer your question a little more firmly, Mike, we will err on the side of caution and for um, public hearings where there may be a, a large amount of interest, add on, you know, 500 extra slots, which is very small in fee, just to be sure that everyone who wants to actually come in there and speak would be fine. We can, we can go as high as you'd like to feel comfortable with, but just in the way Rhonda has been having information on these cert on how to access um, through the website and we'll follow the same path that she has thus far because residents are getting comfortable with it. Okay. So I, I think that's where we're at for now. Any, anything else within that realm? I guess my biggest question would be how can we pilot something like this? I just want, I'm wondering, is there a way to pilot it? Maybe Which portion? It maybe um, do a virtual public hearing and maybe have our employees help us test it out perhaps or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of how could we figure out logistically how to manage it? Well, just to give it a test run before we do it live and in living color. And we can do that, Mike. We can find a way to have, I mean, I'm sure my wife would be happy to chime in and, and play, play in a, a resident trying just to get the queue going and stuff like that. But aside from that, I was talking to Pete a little bit earlier and one thing we could do is take a look at some of the stuff like we have the those KOA public hearings that for the rezonings that nobody's really come in on. I think it'd be wise for us to start with something like that, just right. to make sure we, we can handle it and kind of work our way up to the stuff. I mean, because it's a combination of A, you know, it's going to be June before this stuff gets running and this stuff's going to start falling off. Hopefully we'll be able to have some people in town hall. So it's going to be a real progression, but I think you're right. Let's start with, with something that we can not, would gives us some leeway to, to work out the kinks. Where there might be just one or two residents who sign on to speak. Right. Sure. If any. I love it. Yeah. Agreed. Frankly, Mike, I think the other wise choice would be basically anybody who comes up should anticipate their public hearing being open for a minimum of two board days. Which would be 30 days ish, something like that. Right. Right. I, I like that. Yep. In interest of time, that's all I have on that. We can keep dialoguing as needed, but we'll start with that. You're still muted, John. I don't know what's next on your agenda. Uh, do we need any motion on that, Jen? Or can we just move on? It was just We're a discussion good. item. Okay. Yeah. Next thing I have is uh, item number seven, town donation, Pete Marston. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if I call this a donation or a, or a re-gift or what I call it, but let me show you real quick. <laughs> that guy's got pants on. I was wondering. This is from the Glopper Memorial Park. It was removed because they're replacing it during the renovations. Um, the town was the original, original purchaser of it, so it was given back to us. Um, I, I was probably the easiest to get to because town hall was closed and I was available. So they gave it to me. I don't particularly know what to do with it, but I think we should do something with it. Maybe historical society. Pete, I, I I'm, Pete, I'm kind of in the same boat as you, though for different reasons. I have two historical items. Um, I'm waiting to hear from the historical preservation group or Mike in that regard. So when you when you hear, let me know or vice versa. I'll get back to you on both of those. But that's so I have no cool. problem with the Horse Historical Society weighing in, but um, you know, I'll store it for now for a nominal fee. Just let me know where you want it. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. I mean, maybe it can go at the Golden Age Center. Maybe we can find a place to hang it near the front door or something like that. Put a vet well, park too, since it is veterans on there. I don't know for sure, but I, I'm told there's some disparities on it where some things are a little bit incorrect. So that also needs to be discussed that the new plaque there was a, uh There was a gentleman who attended Tonawanda High School, I believe, but he lived on Grand Island and he was, they did track him down and his name is being added to the new plaque. Correct. Correct. Cool. 
Uh, item, item eight is uh, geographic information systems. Jen? All right. Um, I don't have a screen share for that, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes that once in a while I'll forward it on to John, but I wanted to let you all know, Kevin from Lynx has been working wonderfully with um, five departments on distributing and um, getting the tablets into the right hands. Your five department heads have now assigned each of their two, uh, two employees from their department to one of the GIS tablets knowing full well someone has to be assigned, but it can be used by many other people within the department. And some it won't be and in some it will. Um, the, start, the startup and the complexity related to that is happening now. Um, but beyond that, uh, the current item that they're, that's on the agenda that they're deciding on together and collaborating about, since this is an, it is a Windows-based uh, tablet, some of them are going to have IPS on there and some will not need it. So the department heads are working with Kevin to get the correct uh, software, so to speak, on there based on what each department needs. So despite the fact that we're in the middle of this quarantine, everything came in, um, there may be an option that we wanna pursue down the road with docking stations because you could just set the tablet there and go and not have to worry about breaking the charger or whatnot. That might be more conducive if we, if we wanna do something like that. But right now they're getting into, into hands for use during this time. And then as um, time unfolds and when we want to put some more money into it, we can develop a few more apps as needed. But right now we're at a really good place and everybody has what they ordered and what they need. And I'll keep it at that because of time. Okay, thank you, Jen. Yeah. And sticking with Jen, again, we have the cons consolidated funding application, the grants plan. All right, I'm gonna do another screen share. Apparently, I guess I have too much time on my hands or when meeting like this, um, it's just better, I feel like to have things typed out. Um, so I attended right after our department head meeting last week, I attended a workshop on the consolidated funding application because I didn't feel like um, we've been as unified as a board on the CFA as we could have. Um, just a quick review for the new board members, even though John, I'm sure you're so familiar with the CFA, you're, you could be giving this yourself, but it's the web-based portal that for the last nine years, um, the town would use for many of its grants. There's over, 30, I think I put in there, yeah, 30 programs from 10 different agencies. And over the last couple of years, there's actually the ability to clone our application from last year. And if you've ever done anything with grants, you know, it's so tedious. If you can clone right. um, and we can work with Rotella to do that, uh, securing the username and password, it would really, really help us. Um, I bring it up now because round 10 is scheduled to begin. Um, I checked this morning, it's not out yet, but sometime in early May through the end of July, the program book will be out and we should be having um, a chance to look through that. Uh, if you look at it online, it can look daunting. It's over 300 pages because it is so descriptive, but um, we discussed this last year, having all the uh, board members and relevant department heads, appropriate department heads, I think I wrote here, review the guidebook when it comes out and soon after that meet and develop a transparent plan with Rotella for any grants that we wish to pursue. Most of the grants we pursue um, year after year are included. The WIA, I've always called it the WIIA, but it's actually WIA. That's not until September. And I checked with Lynn on this because I wasn't sure. When we have our capital project or plan meeting, that can occur earlier and separate from anything to do with our grants plan meeting. So my desire is just that as a board, as we attempt to you know, unify and work together, we try to be much more transparent in what we're pursuing. Um, both to the community and then within, within the town. So as soon as the link comes out for that, um, it didn't sound like there would be a delay because of the coronavirus and we can see what programs are there. I'm gonna send that link your way and we can start digging through to see what is wise and right for our community. But I don't know if any of that's helpful to you. I'll send the link around and we can really spend these three months or as much time as they give us to really, like I said, do what's wise and right for Grand Island. Um, Am I missing anything in terms of how we want to approach this grant cycle? No, but I think the more we can leverage that and put in a good application, the better for the entire town. So that's that's great that you're looking into that. Yeah, I want it, I want it to be all of us and all department heads working together on it because everyone has something to offer. Um, and I want us to be able to get on it early. I know the department heads would really value that. And 
people like Bob, Pam, Pat, you guys all have so much you can offer and create and working with Rotella on doing the best application possible. So uh, I'll, I'll send you guys the link when it comes out. Thank you, Jen. Yep. Next item on the agenda is again, something that Jen May is going to talk about, residential concerns regarding you, gas prices. You wouldn't think I have kids at home or anything like that, or that I'm busy with the number of things on the agenda. This is just something that residents um, continue to put before us. And I think as elected officials, um, we're required to address in one way or another the concerns that they bring up to us. And this is something since I was elected, I've heard a ton about and we can determine it's not within our realm to uh, pursue. This isn't the job of an elected official. We can go whole hog in on this and have a big meeting with Godfrey and you know storm the attorney general's door. We can land somewhere in the middle just for a little bit of data, um, when this was looked at before, there was often a disparity between gas prices on and off island, sticking with the Neary County between five or six cents. Um, with technology these days, it's so easy to see, sometimes even within an hour of um, the actual data, what disparity there is between gas prices. I initially looked over um, in Niagara County and we see a big difference there. Uh, and it's going to be different because the taxes could be different. But um, standardly on Grand Island, our gas stations were all 235 on Saturday. But in Niagara Falls and over on Buffalo Avenue, they're 205, 204. And we can say that doesn't matter because um, their taxes are different. Um, but it would matter now if um, they're crossing the bridge because it's always the excuse that's been given. So I broadened the search a little bit more um, looking within our county, right on the other side of our bridge. Um, and it's the Sunoco on Delaware, 217. The mobile along Ellicott Creek, 218. So the differences that we're seeing compared to years ago when this was looked at are now 17, 18, getting close to 20 cents on a certain day. And um, if they're crossing our bridges, we can't be using the excuse of, well, we had to go over the bridge to get there. So I'm giving you this data as a board. Um, we can discuss it with legal and we can talk about it together, but it seems to me that the disparity is growing. Um, the board wisely looked into it before, but if that gap is broadening, it is our job to represent and bring our concerns to the appropriate um, people within our in our state government or whoever we need to. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that as a discussion for the board at another time. I just and want just, you to have the data. This is a note on Saturday, I filled up at a, for $1.87 in Springville. And most of the stations there were right in that range, $1.87 to $1.90. So, I mean, that's yeah. 48 cents. So. I, I tried to keep my comparisons, Mike, really close to us. I, I mean, understand. five miles away. But that's data, and we can decide as a board what we want to do with it. But I, I kind of see it as not a something I'm campaigning for in any way. It's bringing forward concerns that the residents are bringing to us, and then us deciding in a unified way how we want to act on it. And so that's all I got. History, is there anything we can do there? I mean, is there anything worth doing in something like that? Sending a letter to the local gas stations. You can do that and the New York State Attorney General will prosecute under the general business law, uh, price gouging, especially that which exists as a result of a uh, natural disaster. Um, so if it was, you know, it was determined that, that somebody was using a uh, situation to his or her advantage, it could, you know, potentially be something that they would, uh, uh, consider taking on the AG does have uh, this came up last a few years ago you have a call and the AG um, got pretty aggressive and you know threatened to beat up a, a few folks that weren't uh, being uh, even-handed and uh, I think that they fairly promptly um, changed their course of action so we could you know residents can contact the Attorney General anybody that's interested the town board could if it wanted to um, designate somebody to reach out to the uh, key executives and the companies with uh, stations on the island um, and, you know, tell them that residents have brought this to our concern and uh, to their concerns in this regard to the board's attention. And, you know, they hope they'll do something about it. You know, otherwise, maybe the town board will um, make a referral to the uh, appropriate uh, folks at the AG. But there's a Consumer Frauds Bureau and I think even in Buffalo, the district office of the AG, um, We'll, uh, we'll take this stuff on. So maybe start with a letter to each one of the businesses on the island, give them the opportunity to respond, and then if we need to escalate it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I know we're short on Fair time. Enough. Okay. Thank you. 
Jen, the last item we have is our capital plan. We do our five-year capital improvement plan review annually. It's that time of year again. Jen, do you want to expound on that, please? Yep. Um, Lynn, as you know, uh, worked on the um, plans for that today. You know, she has to put together a bunch of numbers based on things she receives from Pam. So uh, we thought it wise and transparent that we pick the date for that workshop while we are in workshop because a lot of people see it. And in addition to the way that um, Patty goes ahead and wisely makes it publicized, um, we pick a day today, we cover a lot of, it's, it's good practice to pick it today. So um, sometime later this week, as long as there's enough notice, Patty can advise when we could have that meeting. And that would be a full town board meeting with appropriate department heads as usual for that one. Patty, you can turn your microphone off if you want to talk about that. I just set the date and we'll uh, we'll get it posted. Anybody have a preference? How many hours of notice do we need, Patty? Seventy-two. Uh, we're supposed to, yes. I mean, if we needed to have a meeting, we can certainly accommodate it. But I was think I think Jen was thinking Wednesday or Thursday of this week. I'd say Thursday, if that's a day that works for others. The greatest for me, but I can make it work as long as we do it earlier rather than later. I'd have to be done by eight o'clock. I don't have a strong pull toward Thursday. I, I defer to what people's schedules are like right now. Mine's very flexible. Mike, you're muted. Mike, we can't, you're muted, Mike. You. I've been talking right along, whether you know oh, it or boy. not. It seemed like you were answering. I'd um, rather have someone with a demanding schedule pick the day. So, I mean, Tom, is it better for you if it was after five o'clock? I just, Ashley's got, she's doing an online something at eight o'clock that I have to be with the kids for by eight, so. That's fine. So, I mean, During Thursday the day? At three, no, at Thursday eight on four. Thursday. I think could do it we can do it earlier Thursday I don't care when as long as I'm by eight Thursday at three sure all in favor it'll be what it has to be there's a there's a sidewalk uh progress meeting at 2 p.m can we do it at 3 30 yeah 3 30 okay Zoom. Okay. I'll set that one up and make sure I invite all the right people. Alrighty, that concludes our. You got a resolution. You got a resolution, and Patty, did you get the resolution on scheduling that board meeting? Uh, oh, okay. we don't don't need a resolution, but I've got it for Thursday at three thirty for a capital plan meeting, and that's going to uh, include for uh, a notification to department heads. Correct. Yes, Correct. you should do a resolution. It's fine. Okay, we need a resolution to go into executive session for legal advice. Oh, real real quick before we leave this, uh, Peter Godfrey, if mm -hmm. you're going to work on a letter which you want to send out to local gas stations, I would I would very much prefer to see it before we send out a anything as a town board. I am, I am a little bit apprehensive about asking local businesses to lower their prices right now. Um, so can we just keep that, like bring that around for the next meeting and have a look at it and talk about it? Yeah, I, I would imagine, you know, rather than being sent to legal, it's really, it's it's more of a, at this point, as we're, we're not threatening to sue them at this point. It's simply right, no. a communication that residents have brought. Expressing a concern this yeah. to our concern and but I, I can you know help with a, a draft of a letter to, to John that he can uh, um, you know I assume would come from the, the town supervisor and start yes. to be circulated to the board for comment okay, guys, we gotta go. yeah so I would say let's we don't need legal to do that one okay. just to save money it okay. would be better to come from the board uh, I didn't come and, from and the I board think it's more just people. bringing to their attention you know I believe in capitalism but also I've believe in being fair too. And if it's a typically high here, I'd like to, an explanation if they can give it to us. I, I would agree. I mean, I did some research on it and um, there is no real reason that it's higher here other than it's convenience. Um, I've talked to the people who truck the fuel. Uh, I drove around Sunday to 
from Lackawanna, here to Lackawanna, and I found some prices higher. I found a lot of prices lower. But then again, I, I'm not comfortable going to a local business right now and say, you need to lower your profit margin because everybody, whether you want to admit it or not, is choking. Just Nobody's bad. driving. Uh -huh. Nobody's driving. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bad timing. I'm getting three days to the gallon. Huh? I'm getting three days to the gallon. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even buying the gas I normally do. I mean, I just think the timing, if we are going to look at this holistically as a board, is wrong. That's all I got to say. I think that's that same concern exists at all the different gas stations, and it's it just seems like it's atypically high here relative to just about all the surrounding areas. Seems like one thing we can all do is is tell people to make their own referrals to the attorney general's office if they have a problem with it. Because frankly, exactly. I'm with Pete that ordinarily these types of problems are solved by the people. They can go to the AG. They can try and organize a group to say, you know what, we're not going here anymore. They want to fix right. that. It's really within their jurisdiction, not ours. But you know, gas is something that's a little different than most things. So exactly. Well, if you really want to prove your point, just don't buy it. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right. I need to entertain a motion to get into executive session. So moved. Second. Second. Legal advice. Uh, yeah. Motion by Mike Madigan. Second by Jen Bainey. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Bob Westfall, I sent you an invite to this as well. I just want to make sure it. you got it. Okay, good. All right, all. Um, all right. And we're going to uh, go. Oh, to 